Um, my name is Tom Makoka, and I, um, I run a program at the school in which um, students every year um, learn to investigate war quality, doing either chemistry or biology. And tonight we're going to hear from the chemist first and the biologist second. And, uh, and this, uh, most of this is funded from grant money, Eisenhower grant money. Really, the taxpayers of Gilderland haven't paid anything but my salary to do this. Of course, that's significant for most taxpayers. But um, this has been, been grant money. Part of the grant is that, um, that we do outreach to the community. So we open this to the community members who are interested. And uh, we hope that they'll be interested um, because we're talking about the quality of the water that they drink. So tonight, we're going to hear um, something about the quality of that water. We're going to start with, uh, let's see, we have, let me tick off the people once they, as they come up. Um, we have Jacob Mauer, who's going to talk about nitrates. Rosara Milstein is going to talk about chloride levels. And also, she's taken on the additional burden of talking about pH and conductivity, which we did as a class, but she's going to talk about what the class found for their, for their results. Followed by Brian Tomasic, who's also going to talk about phosphate levels, but he did additional study this year. He looked at phosphate levels in the actual reservoir and the sediments of the reservoir. So sort of extended our interest or our reach to the reservoir. Um, the streams that we've been studying are the three streams that feed the reservoir: the Black Creek, the Bowie Kill, the Norman's Kill. That we're going to hear about tonight. And last, but certainly not least, we have a duo. Um, this is Boyce's. Research biology class students, Jennifer Crowley, Chasley Bay. We're going to talk about um, the biology of Black Creek and the Bozeman. So let's get started so you can all go home and, and uh, enjoy your Friday evening doing other things. All right. I did nitrates in the Little Moon uh, Rivers. Uh, nitrates uh, enter the environment through four main sources, which are fertilizer, sewage, manure, and feedlots. And they're used for many things because they're necessary in the production of proteins in the body. Uh, when they enter the body, uh, human or animal bodies, uh, they become nitrites, uh, NO2 land. And uh, this has serious health effects. It interferes with the production of oxygen in the body, which can lead to blue baby syndrome. Yes. Uh, dangerous, uh, yes, it is dangerous with high levels for infants. And, uh, the EPA has recommended that no levels exceed 10 parts per million in one. Can we uh, show you the time experiment? Uh, basically, this is a redox reaction, a reaction where, um, in the end, an amber colored species is um, produced, um, which is proportional to the amount of nitrate that was first uh, in the sample. So, therefore, by using a um, spectrophotometer, you can, use, you can analyze the um, original concentration of nitrates in the water. Alright, I made up a standard curve, so I could do just that, find the absorbance based on the concentration. So, uh, the linear regression that I used was 0.181x plus 0.04, which, um, so if I enter in the concentration as x, that will give me uh, the absorbance, um, which is y. Um, <laughs> um, I measured <laughs> Black Creek. Um, I mean, I measured um, three samples from Black Creek Rivers, which were um, Bolson, Kill, uh, Bolson Kill River, Marsh River, and around the bus garage, and, um, oh, and, the and I measured um, three the samples for each site. Um, I plotted the average uh, spring result for each location and the average uh, fall. This spring, but the lower results are actually the spring and the red ones are actually the fall. And I also plotted the blue ones are um, the 10 parts per million, and this gives you an idea of how low the uh, levels in the water actually are. Um, there's certainly no cause for concern in the four, four uh, rivers that this is. Uh, this is a graph of nitrate levels in the past years, with Pulse and Kill being the red line, Marsh being the yellow line, Plus Garage being the green line. Uh, you may notice a sudden increase in the fall of all three. I believe this is due to the uh, drought that we experienced during the summer, uh, with little uh, precipitation, uh, less nitrates were able to exit the system, and we see a sharp decrease going into spring. I believe this is due to the heavy precipitation that we received during the winter, 
which uh, race, uh, which uh, mercury levels. Uh, nitrate ions are one of the most soluble ions in existence, and they react uh, very much to both precipitation through the year.
speech. Um, as you can see, many, oh, sorry. Um, there. Um, many animals cannot survive at very acidic pHs. As you see, as the pH decreases, the amount of aquatic life that can be sustained also decreases. Um, so this could be cause for concern. Um, this is a graph showing from the Black Creek Marsh area and upstream location that we tested. Um, the fall compared to the spring, and again, the spring pH is less than the fall pH, and this is something that I would have predicted because the pH of I already told you about kind of the pH of snow is lower than the pH of water. So during the winter, when the snow runs off into the stream, it has a lower pH than the water that would be there during the summer. So that could be something that would attribute to the lower pH levels. Can you see that again? As you can see, during, oh, it's not really west, it's spring. <laughs> 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 Sorry about that. But uh, as you can see, the pH levels are on the side and they decrease. The general trend is that they do decrease during the spring. Um, that's pH and kind of food. I did phosphorus in the water and the sediment of the Waterloo Reservoir. Introduction, phosphorus in lakes. The phosphorus is an important element in lake biology. <clears throat> Elemental phosphorus is rare in nature, but it's often present in the orthophosphate ion, PO4-3-. In lakes and reservoirs, phosphorus can be dissolved in the water, although its solubility is low, <coughs> or can be suspended on sediment particles as phosphorus bonds readily to soil. Inorganic phosphates often precipitate to the bottom of lakes as aluminum, iron, calcium, or magnesium phosphates, which are insoluble in water. Organic phosphates are often associated with carbonaceous tissue. These various types of phosphorus are present in the phosphorus cycle. This is a diagram. Inorganic phosphorus from natural and human sources comes in. Plants convert it to organic phosphorus. Animals take in and release that organic phosphorus. That organic phosphorus goes to bacteria, which convert it back to inorganic phosphorus. Total phosphorus is the um, measure of how much phosphorus could be potentially used by plants, because uh, plants can only use the orthophosphate form, but other types of phosphorus, like organic and more complex inorganic forms, can be converted to orthophosphate. So total phosphorus shows the amount that can be potentially used by plants. Even if little of the phosphorus in a lake is present in the orthophosphate form, the phosphorus cycle is often able to occur quickly enough that a steady supply of orthophosphate can be kept available. Phosphorus is often the growth limiting factor of the limiting nutrient in lakes, which means that the lack of the element available for plants is the single most important factor restricting further plant growth. Eutrophication. Excess phosphorus in lakes is the primary cause of eutrophication, which is the increase in productivity measured as the amount of plant and algae biomass of a lake. Eutrophication is most serious in the summer because the most plant growth occurs during the season. Increased amounts of organic matter in water create more disinfection byproducts, which form when chlorine and other water treatment plant disinfectants mixed with organic matter. These byproducts, such as trihalomethanes and haloacetic acids, they cause cancer, as well as liver, kidney, and central nervous system damage. Nutrient cycling in lakes. Decomposition processes often release phosphorus that is bound up in sediment, allowing it to dissolve in pore water, which is the water between the soil particles in the bottom of the lake. Normally, this phosphorus quickly precipitates out when it's exposed to oxygen, but when lower sections of a lake become anoxic, which means that oxygen levels are too low to detect, in the lake somewhere soluble, phosphorus is often able to build up. And then when the water temperature becomes more uniform, usually in the spring and fall, then some of this water and soluble phosphorus can rise to the surface, causing algal blooms. This then consumes greater amounts of oxygen when bacteria um, have to decompose this organic matter, and that causes the water to become increasingly anoxic. Then 
that releases more precipitated phosphorus into the water from the sediment that causes more plant growth and that further depletes oxygen. And this is kind of a diagram representing that. As oxygen decreases, more phosphorus is released, which then increases plant growth, and then the increased organic matter uh, consumes more oxygen because of decomposition. These were the results. Uh, this shows the concentrations of total phosphorus in milligrams per liter at various sites in the reservoir. Um, there's doesn't really seem to be much of a trend from this data of whether phosphorus increases and decreases from the beginning to the end of the reservoir or from these uh, upper and lower parts of the streams. Uh, above 0 0.01 milligrams per liter, according to sources I found at RPI, the concentration um, that con above that concentration eutrophication is most likely to occur in lakes. This is the same that I measured the concentration of just the orthophosphate, which is just the form available to plants. Um, and it's, again, there doesn't seem to be much of a trend of it, uh, apparent from this data, although the levels are mostly lower than the total phosphorus levels. This is the concentrations of uh, total phosphorus in the sediment. It's in micrograms per gram of sediment. Uh, again, like the other data, there's not much of a trend from that you can see. And this is the orthophosphate concentrations in the sediment. Comparison to other lakes. A DEC source stated that most lakes and reservoirs in the area have levels of total phosphorus between 0 0.01 and 0 0.03 milligrams per liter, and the average is about 0 0.02 milligrams per liter. The average concentration of total phosphorus in the water Waterloo Reservoir was 0 0.02 milligrams per liter, which is within normal range. This is the concentration of phosphorus in other nearby lakes. Thompson's Lake is 0 0.008 milligrams per liter. Warner's Lake is 0 0.011. Lenham Gilboa Reservoir is 0 0.016 and Dwayne Lake is 0 0.031. The DEC source also stated that most people aren't concerned as much with the concentration of phosphorus in the sediment as they are with the amount of phosphorus that goes from the sediment into the water. And the levels in the sediment of the water at the reservoir average 230 micrograms per gram for total phosphorus, which is quite lower than the levels in one eutrophic lake in Iowa in a study I found which had an average of 630 micrograms per gram of phosphorus in the upper sediment. Fine, just for a minute, tell us what you plan to do this okay. summer. Uh, I'm going to continue sampling. Um, since I found that the concentrations in the sediment aren't really that important, I'm going to mostly do the water samples again. You're going to look at what? what? The concentrations of total phosphorus and orthophosphorus. See if you can see something of, um, generating on the bottom? Yeah. in recent years, the water quality of the surrounding area has uh, become an increasing concern. And with the increase of housing developments and construction and pollution, um, the integrity of our water has been contributing. And um, by monitoring <coughs> strict streams like a Black Creek and Bowling Hill, we can take care of our water. Um, some of the vocabulary terms we'll be using in the um, presentation, just so you know what we're all talking about. Um, we wanted to highlight for you. First of all, what we were sampling were macroinvertebrates, which are aquatic insects without any backbone. And we are sampling the macroinvertebrates to um, different macroinvertebrates have different assigned biotic values. Um, and we are trying to find the impact level of the street. And that brings me to my next uh, vocabulary term. In, the impact level is the amount of, the amount of stream is impacted, and from least to worst, um, it's not impacted, slightly impacted, moderately impacted, and then severely impacted. And our biotic index is the combined biotic values of the individual 
macroinvertebrates, and then it is divided by the total number of organisms in our sample. So basically, it's like an average. The higher the average is, uh, the better the water quality is. These are just a few of the uh, pictures of um, what we were sampling from the sites. Um, the three, three main primary organisms we are looking for is the stonefly, the mayfly, and the caddisfly, as you can see. And um, these are the ones with the highest biotic values, and if, or some of the highest biotic values. And if, you, and if these three organisms are in our water quality, um, we are able to evaluate how well it is. And this is basically a map of where we uh, sample. As you can see, um, actually, the black creek blue dot right there, that was like a bus garage. And um, the Rosen Hill is off of Route 155. What? I mean, 1158, sorry. Wow. <laughs> so um, that's basically where we sample. This is the Bozen Hill area where we sampled. And we were sampling the riffle points, which is the um, Points of the ripple, right here. Um, points where there is a high velocity in the stream, and these points are where there is a lot of um, dissolved oxygen. And so the organisms we are looking for, this is their habitat. And we also have the Black Creek, and we can, again the ripple point we were sampling is right here. Basically, where you can see the water moving on top. So, that's the way to think of it. All right, for, okay, basically, what we did was uh, we went to these ripple points where we could see the water moving, and we took 50 samples from a, actually a kit net. What we did, we set up this kit net a little bit uh, downstream, and we Dr. McCulloch my pilot for us, and what we did, we went like maybe two meters upstream, and we started kicking at the rocks in the dirt at the bottom. And that let um, little organisms were in the rocks, they would float downstream and get caught in the net. Um, from there, we would pick off whatever sample were filtered out. So we got about half of our samples from there, so that's 50 organisms. And then, after that, we went out to the middle of the stream and just we, um, picked up upstream bottom and start just picking off samples from the rock themselves by the four steps. And um, we picked out organisms, not only the big organisms, but we had to look for the smaller organisms too, which is kind of difficult. And after we picked out the organisms and stuck them away, we brought them back to Mr. McCulloch's room and sorted and identified them. And calculated the biotic index values, and then we repeated this um, process for each stream respectively in the fall of 202 and then the spring of 203. All right, well, um, for our fall to them, two results. Uh, the most important biotic index is 73.3, which is pretty good. It means it's uh, slightly competitive. And uh, the black creek, the biotic, And what we have here is we have um, kind of a graph to show a comparison of what we got in the Black Creek. Um, on the left, we have the um, New York, and I quote, model community. It's um, basically a percentage of each of the organisms we're looking for. And it's a general guideline to what a healthy stream would be. And on the right, we have our own stream, the Black Creek in the fall, and we had 48% caddish fly, and then 42% of other organisms. And so you can kind of see the difference in the streams and their percentages of organisms. And then we have the, again, the New York model community compared to the bows and kill in the fall. And we had 1% stonefly, 
We had 88% caddis flies, 5% beetles, and then 6% others. And so you can again see comparison between the two. And there's there's 100 organisms in each sample, so that's the <laughs> point. <laughs> All right, um, for the spring results, we actually had uh, our own 100 sample thing, so we sorted and identified our own samples. Um, we collected them at the same time, though. And for my results, uh, Rose and Hill antibiotic index of 80.3, which means it's not infected. That is really good. And uh, for Black Green, I got a biotic index of 56, which still is moderately infected, but uh, the biotic and my results for the spring were the Bozen Hill had a biotic index of 81.3, and the Black Creek had a biotic index of 66. And if you just take a look at this results, you can see how accurate this evaluation is for detecting the streams, because between the two of us, we were pretty much the same. The Black Creek was a little bit different, but for the Bozen Hill, we only we're a little bit off, so something to know. And then we have the New York model communities again <coughs> compared to the Black Creek in the spring, spring, and we see a considerable improvement in our biodiversity of the stream compared to our fall results. And um, this is a trend we have noted um, from past years that the biodiversity and the general biotic index for the fall for the streams is not as good as the biotic index and biodiversity for the spring. And we'll discuss some of the reasons for that. And then we have the Bozen Hill in the spring, and we have our New York model community again, and our sample. Um, this is basically a timeline. Um, we have it from the fall, no, spring 2002. Oh. Yes, the spring, spring of 2002, 2002 uh, spring 2003. So you can see how um, it goes down in the fall and back up in the spring, down, back up. And, um, if you look at all the high points in uh, the run graph, it's steadily going up just a little bit, but it should be noted that there was a drought. So um, that could be a reason for the slight downward trend. And um, just so you realize, the different levels, um, not impacted is the blue, that's our best. And then we have slightly impacted is yellow, the orangey color is moderately impacted, and the red is severely impacted. So we're quite out of the danger zone. This is the Bozen Hill. We uh, again have a slight downward dip, but not that bad. And again, it should be noted that we did have the drought in the past two years, which can add to the um, decrease. And so that's the Bozen Hill. All right, well, um, you said that reasons for our results have been actually to the runoff of major roads around uh, our sites and whatever may be running on any and chemicals really salt, whatever, it could be impacting the life there. Because macro bird and bird rights are very sensitive to their surroundings and they can only live in certain optimal environments. So um, um, that's that's one reason. And not get by construction. It's not really a huge thing. It's just to touch on that. It's not a big deal. And um, the life cycles, actually, yeah. Yes, um, the life cycles. Um, one of the reasons we sample in both the fall and the spring is because um, obviously um, macro invertebrates have life cycles, and during different times of the year, for example, mayflies. We sample in the fall and the spring, and mayflies peak at, in May. And so if we go to sample in May, we will not find any mayflies in the stream because they're all in the air. Because um, they go out of their larval stages and become adults. And so um, as the 
year goes by, you will encounter different organisms with different biotic values. So that's another reason for the fluctuation. Also, seasonal cycles. Um, in the spring, we have a lot more runoff, which results in higher riffle points and more dissolved oxygen. So that's another reason. And then, of course, in the last two years, we've mentioned there has been a drought. Well, um, the water quality stream was expected to be slightly to moderately impacted. And um, just to review, the black cave was moderately impacted and the golden flow was slightly impacted. And the water quality went down in the past two years. But I think with the golden kill, it stayed pretty consistent. Um, a more downward trend is with the uh, black creek. You can see it more clearly with the golden kill, but uh, it, it's not. By much was a huge change. And just to recap, um, as we said, the Bozen Kill showed a decrease in the water quality, and we believe it should be further monitored to make sure it goes back up now that um, we seem to be getting more precipitation and make sure it returns to past levels. The Black Creek has, though, shown a downward trend and um, wasn't impacted by the drought. Um, we're not quite sure. Um, it could also um, be the effect of pollution from the old army depot site and perhaps some of the new construction. And um, we feel that future monitoring is very important to help us solve this question. And as you can see, we just have the Bozen Hill, as we said, stay pretty much the same, but we do see the Platte Creek going down a bit. So um, thank you very much. Thank you.